I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at the Holy Word of God through the lens of sacred tradition that goes back to Jesus and His apostles. Now, we'd love to have you be part of the program. Uh, you can do that by sending your questions by email to scriptureandtradition at ewtn.com or follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. Now today, we will continue our discussion of Judas Iscariot and how even though his actions fulfill Old Testament prophecies and his actions set in motion the saving death of Jesus, Judas Iscariot is still fully responsible for his evil deed. And we'll show a bit from Scripture, how this is true, because the way accomplish, a person accomplishes a good matters very greatly in the moral judgment of the action. In other words, the end does not justify the means. Now, we are still going through my book, Wheat and Tares, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church which you can get at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Just go to EWTNRC.com and you will see that it is item 81098, 81098. All right, so let's take a look at this. We're looking at the Gospels, Matthew 26, verse 23, and the parallel in Mark chapter 14, verse 20, it's pretty much the, the same phrase um, where it says that Jesus identifies who the betrayer is, but he doesn't mention his name. He mentions his action. And he says that the betrayer is, quote, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me. Now, this is a very important action. It's not just, yeah, he happened to be dipping in the dish with me. No. This is a very specific action. And I've been blessed to be so often in the Middle East and in a wide variety of countries in the Middle East. And when my friends, for instance, I, I had one friend who's passed away now, but Karim Abu Atta, when he took me out to eat at a restaurant for lunch, he uh, would sometimes order special dishes. <laughs> In fact, bless his heart, he would go into the kitchen and make it himself. He ended up getting banned from a lot of kitchens in Jerusalem. But at any rate, he would have a special dish and he would take a piece of bread, you know, the pita bread that is normal over there, and he would break a piece off. This is why you break bread and you, you can't double dip. And you break a piece of bread off and he would dip it into a dish and give it to me and put it in my mouth. That was something we wouldn't do in our culture. It's not a normal thing uh, for us to do. Uh, but over there, it's, it's something totally acceptable. And it is a sign of great friendship and trust that, you know, I knew that he had such a fine taste in food. And so I trusted him to give me something that would be good to eat. But he also trusted me that I would accept his gift. You know, so that is a sign of friendship. The reason I go into all this is that 
this friendship is what Jesus is extending to Judas. To dip into the same dish is a sign of trust. In fact, there's an etiquette. You know, say you have a dish of hummus or some other dish, and they'll, they'll always put some olive oil on top. And then polite people take their bread and dip it along the edge rather than going right through the middle and into the olive oil. You dip along the edge and work your way toward the olive oil. That's a sign of politeness. And again, friendship and trust. Judas is dipping the bread in the same dish with Jesus. And this is our Lord extending to him one last effort, one last motion to show that I still want you to be my friend. Something that our Lord will say later on in the Last Supper after he had left. <clears throat> I no longer call you servants, but my friends. He wanted to have Judas as one of his friends. And Judas does not respond well. Now, Jesus had predicted the betrayal, and he identified the traitor with this act of friendship. And he extended his hand at this last moment in order to revive the relationship so it wouldn't be broken by betrayal. And this is, again, this last moment, but by mentioning this act of dipping the morsel of bread, the little piece of bread, uh, but morsel, I don't know, um, I wouldn't use that so much. Some translations do, but it's just a small piece of bread that you break off of a, a flat bread. Jesus allowed Judas to act with complete freedom of will. He's giving him this option, and he has freedom. And this is important because a lot of people think, well, Judas was just fated to do this. It's more like a Greek understanding that the fates decreed this and therefore it's going to happen. Not so. Our Lord gives the son of friendship to show that he has freedom of will. And, you know, it's also in the lack of mentioning Judas's name. Had he said, Judas Iscariot is the one who is betraying me you can be sure that the other apostles would have jumped on him and restrained him from going back to the, the high priests to lead the uh, police over to betray Jesus. You can be sure they would have. Jesus doesn't give his name because he wants him to have that freedom of action. And even though it, it's something bad. And this is something that all of us have to keep in mind, that sometimes we feel compelled to be sinful. But we have to call ourselves back and remember that we do have freedom of choice. And sometimes I'm also concerned that people say, well, Judas couldn't help it. He was, it was fated to do this. It was predicted he couldn't stop it. Not so. He could. And our Lord was granting him an area of free decision making. And he does that for all of us. All of us. If somebody holds a gun to your head and tells you to do something sinful, that would impede your free will, but even then, you could still choose to be shot rather than commit the sin. Um, sometimes people do have their freedom more compromised. For instance, when they're under torture, and some, you know, some of the people I, I heard stories of uh, priests who were tortured 
in the, by the communists for a long period, sometimes for years. And they, their minds were just gone after the torment and psychological mistreatment. They were tru truly, you know, that, that their mind was, was just gone. And they, they would, I remember one ex-prisoner talked about how this, some of these priests had been forced uh, after the minds were just totally, totally mentally gone, that they would consecrate, uh, or say the prayers of consecration over their own urine and feces. This was the communists destroying their, their personality, their freedom, and their minds, and making them do sacrilege. But, they, but if their minds were gone, then they don't have freedom. But so long as we do have our mind, so long as we do have the ability to think, we still have knowledge of the choices, and that means we have free will. That's why knowledge, intellect, is first. Only with mind can you know what your choices are. And then you can make choices by an act of your free will. Now, this applies to the, the clergy who had abused children. You remember that one of the points of this book is to help us pray through this whole issue of the sex abuse scandal. I think um, this new movie, Sound of Freedom, has widened the scope on what is going on with the abuse of children. And we're seeing some very interesting things take place. The way so many folks in the culture, including Hollywood, and some politicians are trying to dismiss this issue. You know, it's so odd to me that when priests were caught doing this horrible deed of abusing children, they were just excoriated. But now, that it's other people and may include, you know, we just have to pay attention to the lists of people that have already been published as to who went to that island owned by Epstein where they were abusing young girls, you know, teenage girls. And we don't know all that, who did what. But even being in a place like that, includes lots of very famous people and very wealthy people. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they're trying to change. In California, they're, they're trying to pass laws so that child sex traders, people who are engaged in the sex trade with children, won't go to prison for so much. Um, this is really, really odd. They came hard down on priests. Now they're trying to ease up on sex traffickers. And all these folks have free will. And that the betrayal is still theirs to make. And they are responsible for doing these actions. The businessmen, the politicians, the computer geeks that went to Epstein and all this other stuff that's going on now. People are responsible. And this is something that everybody has to examine. That when you choose to gratify your own sensual desires, in an immoral way. You are choosing it. You are not forced. But you are choosing to do that sin. And that's why there is full responsibility. This is a very important thing. The other possibility is that anyone, whether a priest or a politician or businessman, or any other person who attacks the dignity of the young and sexually abuses them, they can be reformed 
it's possible for them to change. They may, if they've broken laws, they still would have to be punished by the law. But even with punishment under the law, they can still have this uh, ability to be restored to Christ. He can forgive them. He is still offering the dish so that they can uh, find, you know, reconciliation. And this is a very important thing. You know, when, when it was the priests who did this, they were celebrating Mass, and Jesus still offered himself to them in Holy Communion. He was making that offer. And the question is always going to be whether they sacrilegiously accept Christ's self-offering and continue to sin, or they also accept his offer of reconciliation in confession and make a firm resolve to amend life and change their lives and see this Jesus cleanse their souls and bring them into a saving relationship with Jesus. This is the call for all sinners and anybody who is involved in any aspect of the sex trade needs to remember that. And any abuse of anybody, whether it's a child or an adult, is abuse. And we have a choice to make. Will we stop doing that? Or will we ex and accept Christ into our lives, accept him to forgive us and begin to heal us? Or will Christ no, have to send us out into the darkness. This is the choice. And by the way, this applies to anybody who's watching pornography. You have to keep in mind that there are some people who do pornography by their own free choice. It's still wrong. It's still wrong. It's still a sin to look at it and to do it. But we also have to remember a number of these children are drugged. That's the chain that they use on these children, is drugs. They don't hold them down with iron chains. They do it psychologically with drugs. And they force them into some of these movies and whatever they do in the uh, pornography. And that, uh, it, being part of looking at pornography is putting yourself at risk not only for the sin of lust, but also of participating in sex slavery. You know, I was blessed to be able to talk to a lot of police and learn about these things from them, and that this is very real. All these people are trying to make this a right-wing conspiracy. Watch them. Watch them. Are they covering up for themselves or for their friends? This is a question that I'm, I have raised. And these politicians who are trying to not let this be so serious a crime all of a sudden, are they covering up for themselves or for some of their friends or their, their donors? This is a question I, I don't know. But I would raise the question. And when you know, uh, citizens have to check on that themselves to make sure they're not participating in it. All right, let's take a break and we'll come back and talk more about what Jesus has to say in regard to Judas Iscariot's responsibility. So please stay with us. <music>
Welcome back. Now, first of all, I want to remind you that we're having our EWTN family celebration. It's going to be on Saturday, August 26th, right here in Birmingham, Alabama. It'll be located at the Birmingham Jefferson Convention Complex, which is right where I-65 and I-2059 meet. And it is something that is free. You don't have to pay to come in at all. But we do want to know who's, com you know, who's coming and how many are going to be there. So if you would go to EWTN.com slash Family Celebration and register, or you can call. The number is toll-free. It's 1-800-447-3986. 1-800-447-3986. And you can register for this free event. And we'd love to have you there. Okay? Look forward to being there myself. All right. So we are now uh, dealing with our Lord's words regarding the responsibility of Judas Iscariot. Let's take a look at Matthew 26, verse 24, where it says, The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Now, that's a pretty strong you know, statement. And when say it's strong judgment, our Lord is the one who can judge us. He knows our hearts and our minds better than we do oftentimes. And in this case, he knows that uh, there, there are prophecies saying that the Son of Man had to die and that he would be betrayed, like in Psalm uh, 41. And his own friend would betray him, that's in Psalm 41. And that Judas fulfilled those prophecies. And he set in motion our Lord's saving death. But he still has full responsibility for his action. That's what Christ is saying here. And the reason for that is how one accomplishes a good goal matters morally. You can't say, well, I have a good goal and therefore I'll do something bad to get that good goal. Nope, that's not permitted. You uh, cannot justify the means by the good end. That, that just doesn't work. That's uh, immoral. The means has to be moral and the goal has to be moral. So in this case, e the evil that was done and chosen to be done by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. Don't forget, it's not in this vacuum. He is doing this for the money. He had prepared himself by stealing from the common purse all along the way. And now he has an opportunity for the big bucks, 30 pieces of silver instead of a few copper coins. And the habit of sin prepared the way for this bigger sin. One of the things that we also see here is that our Lord has another point to make to us about committing these sins. It reminds me of our Lord's teaching on causing scandal. We see this in Matthew 18, verses 5 to 7. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of the, these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fashioned around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. We took a look at this earlier back when we covered chapter 2. 
But this brings out that no matter what your intentions might be, any decision by any adult to abuse children, to harm them, will receive a punishment due to that sin. Some people are given money to sell their children. I watched the, a, a video that was on television about a mother who received a refrigerator for selling her daughter. And she was taken off, in that case, she was taken to China. And this is, is something that she is responsible. She knew, they, they interviewed her afterwards, said, yeah, I know what they're going to do to her. But that's what they did. And she is culpable for selling her daughter. And this is something that applies to anybody who abuses any child, any or adult, by the way, who is also in slavery to sin. This is, this human trafficking uh, is coming over our border in huge numbers. And again, we just keep in mind, today there are about 45 million sex slaves in the world. 45 million. Contrast that with the 12 million slaves brought from Africa between 1600 and 1810 to both North and South America. Today it's far worse. It's four times as many as that. And this is a reality. And then, of course, it's appropriate to think of Judas Iscariot when we talk about priests who abuse children and adolescents. You know, this is something that uh, they, they see. And how we have to remember that our Lord taught his disciples that whatever you do to the weak and the vulnerable you do to me. If you help them, you are doing that help to Jesus. Remember in Matthew 25, whatever you do to the least of my brethren, you do to me. That applies to the sexual abuse. It applies to abortion. We have politicians who call themselves good Catholics and promote abortion. These folks are doing to little children in the womb or ch little children who are enslaved and they're doing it to Jesus. That's how Jesus counts that. You cut babies apart. Jesus counts that as being done to him. And he makes sure in Matthew tw uh, 25, verses 31 to 46, that those who do that to Jesus by doing it to the least of his brethren will be punished for all eternity. This is the reality. He will judge every single individual for what they do wrong. And this is something that we can't neglect. Then we also have to take a look at another aspect. Despite Jesus' last-ditch effort of offering the morsel of bread, the, the piece of bread dipped into the dish, and his final warning that it'd be better for this one not to be born. He's giving him a warning before the, he actually goes out to do the betrayal. Um, we see that Judas did not change his mind. Notice how he cynically asks Jesus, in Matthew 26, verse 25. Is it I, Master? And he, as Jesus said to him, you have said so. This is Judas making it a firm decision. And he has full responsibility even for this cynical question. He knows it's he. He knows it, and he cynically asks, is it I? And 
he also has full responsibility for the deed. And it's at that point that Judas, who, are, again, he had been consecrated one of the first 12 bishops, the first 12 bishops of the church. He was just finishing having received his first Holy Communion at the Last Supper. And he's filled with cynicism and with a decision to get money and betray Jesus. This is what he does. And so he goes off into the darkness of the night. And his move to the darkness after, the, after leaving the upper room is exactly what goes on. People who betray Jesus, people who betray the faith, priests and bishops who betray Jesus and the faith, whether by abusing young people or by denying the faith or denying them or trying to, to do what these politicians are doing and justify immorality. We have bishops and priests, theologians, who would try to justify immoral actions. And that is something that has them going off into the darkness like Judas. And we have to keep in mind that anyone who betrays Jesus, either in the least of his brethren or by denying the faith, denying the teachings of the church, questioning them, bringing them in, instead of defending them, agreeing with the world, they are already in darkness for agreeing with the world on the immorality. So if they go off, they go off into deeper darkness. That's the reality. So we'll stop there because we'll see that this isn't, when Judas leaves the room, that's not the end of the problems. The other disciples still have their difficulties, difficulties that prevented them from understanding, yeah, duh, it might be Judas. And they have their own concerns that distract them, and we'll talk about that next week. Let's take a look at some of your emails first, okay? Good afternoon, Father Mitch. In regards to the Last Supper, did they share a Paschal lamb as part of the meal? I've heard that they did not since Jesus was the new Paschal lamb. Can you clarify, please? Yes. One of the things going on, if you recall, something I mentioned about the Last Supper and the dating of the Last Supper. Passover began the at sunset on Friday, right after Jesus was crucified. That's why they took Jesus down from the cross because the Passover was beginning that evening at sunset. So they need to have him off the cross before then, okay? So they wouldn't have the Passover lamb, but why are they celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread and, you know, the, and the Passover, what's going on? Well, if you remember something I said also earlier, that the Essenes, which was a sect within Judaism at the time of Christ, they, they apparently lived mostly, the core of the community lived at a place called Qumran, down by the Dead Sea. It's where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they were the ones who apparently wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes. But they had a community in Jerusalem, and the upper room is in their neighborhood. Archaeologists have shown that very well. And so they celebrated Passover on Wednesday, not on Friday. So they started their Passover on Wednesday, and the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees celebrated on Friday at sunset. So what's going on? Well, our Lord is celebrating Passover in between, neither with the Essene calendar 
which was solar, nor with the Pharisee Saturday calendar, which was lunar. And instead, he is celebrating his own, where he is truly the lamb of God present at the Last Supper. So they have the unleavened bread and, and wine, of course, but and he consecrates the bread and wine, but he's celebrating in between the, the two other Passovers because he's beginning, as we see in the act, the formula for consecration, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that he is beginning a new and eternal covenant. So he's the Lamb of the new covenant, the Lamb of God, that John the Baptist had pointed him out to be back in the Gospel of John chapter 1. Okay? So hopefully that will help you a little bit. All right, then we also have an email from Teresa. She asks, Dear Father Mitch, why did the Catholic Church decide to number the Ten Commandments differently than the Protestants and the Jewish people? When was that decision made and who made it? Teresa. Well, actually, Teresa, your, your question isn't quite correct. We're dealing again with differences within Judaism. The Pharisees were the ones who survived the destruction of Jerusalem. And they numbered the um, uh, commandments the way you see Protestants do. So Protestants and the Pharisaic uh, sect of Jews have their numbering. Whereas the Catholic Church didn't change the numbering. The numbering, <coughs> the numbering that we use comes from Jewish people, but from the Jews who lived in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, why would we follow the Jews of Alexandria? Very simply, the Jewish people in Alexandria, going back to 250 B.C., had started translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. And it took them a long time. It was, they started off with the first five books, but they kept translating for the next couple hundred years. It took a long time to translate. In fact, if, when you look closely at the Greek version of the book of Jeremiah and the book of Ezekiel, you'll see two people were given that to assign it. And the early church, including the apostles, used that translation, they used the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Why? <coughs> Just like you and I, Teresa, most of the time when we read the Bible, we read not the Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic or original, but we use the uh, English translation. Well, that's what the apostles did. They wrote the New Testament in Greek, so they quoted from that Greek translation of the Bible at Alexandria, Egypt. And the way that they numbered the commandments is the way the Catholic Church does. So we are more in keeping with the tradition of Alexandria because that's what the apostles did. In fact, that would really make this the apostolic way of numbering the Ten Commandments. Well, in the Protestant churches, they went back to the Hebrew text and they used the numbering that the Pharisees used. Okay? That's where that comes from. So it, now, nothing is left out of either set. The Protestants have all the words of the commandments. And the Catholics have all the words of the commandments because neither the Pharisees nor the Jews of Alexandria knew, uh, thought that they could get rid of any part of the commandments. They kept it all, but they just numbered it differently. That's the only difference, okay? All right, I need to take a little break. We'll come back with some more of your questions, so please stay with us.
All right. First of all, I want to invite you to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. And we will be speaking with Aidan Gallagher and Campbell Miller about their new film, Faith of Our Fathers. And in fact, <coughs> excuse me, that movie will premiere on EWTN tomorrow night at 10 p.m. It's a, a wonderful movie about anti-Catholic persecutions of the faithful in Ireland in the 16th and 17th centuries and how this kind of persecution keeps coming up again and again in the parts of the, various parts of the world. And uh, as I uh, was, was talking last week on a radio show, you know, of the, the 75 million martyrs in the history of the church, 40 million died in the last 100 years. The other 35 million died over 1,900 years prior. Think about that. We live in the age of martyrs more than any other time in history, especially because of Nazis, and other nationalistic groups, and the uh, communists and socialists. So they've been the ones who have done the greatest damage to the church. So it'll, it's worthwhile for us moderns to see how people a few hundred years ago responded to persecution. And we can maybe find courage from it. All right. Let's take another email. This one is from Yvonne. Hi, Father Mitch. Why did Jesus like to change his disciples' names? For example, Saul to Paul, Simon to Peter, Thaddeus to Jude, Levi to Matthew, Nathaniel to Bartholomew. How did he get Bartholomew out of Matthew? So that's an interesting question. I'm sure there were many more, but these are a few. I could think of for now. What was he thinking? Yvonne from New Jersey. First of all, Yvonne, a couple things to keep in mind. Our Lord Jesus didn't change all those names. So let's take a look at Nathaniel Bartholomew. What does Bartholomew mean? It means the son of Tolmai. Tolmai is an Aramaic name. But when they transliterate it into Greek, it goes from Ptolemy to Ptolemy. Okay? So Nathaniel is Nathaniel bar Ptolemy. That is, Nathaniel, the son of Ptolemy. So he didn't change his name. Bartholomew would be his last name. Ptolemy. It would be a. English form of it, Tolmison, <laughs> you know, the son of Tolmai. But that's what Bar means in Aramaic, is son. So that's all that that is there. And um, the, uh, with, with Levi to Matthew, again, that's not something that Jesus changed, but he uh, may well have been Levi the uh, son of Matthew, or there's something there, but he has these two names. The one that he did change was Simon, which happened to be the most popular name for boy children among Jewish people at the time of Christ. It goes back most likely to Simon the Maccabee. He was the... Uh, son, the, the, the second son of Mattathias, and he became the ruler of the Jewish people and helped them really have their independence. So Simon was the most popular name among Jewish boys. But Jesus changes that because he's giving Simon, the son of Jonah, a very specific role that you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Remember, in Aramaic, and we see this in um, 
John chapter 1, where he's called Kepha. Kepha is an Aramaic word. It means a crag of rock. That's what Kepha means. And then John says, Kepha, which is transliterated Peter, Petros. So Peter is just the Greek translation of Kepha. And this is a very unusual name. It only is a name for one other person that we know of. And that is a man who lived in the late 5th century B.C. on Elephantini Island. Elephantini Island is an island in the middle of the Nile River at the first cataract. And there was a wedding contract. And the man's name, uh, one, one of the people, they have a number of wedding contracts, but in this wedding contract there was a guy whose name was Kepha. It's the only time we see that. And it makes sense down there because Elephantini Island is itself a crag of rock in the middle of the Nile. The Nile just sort of has to go around it and a lot of other rocks all over the place. So he might well be named after the place. It's a really cool place to go. Um, and so just don't go in the summer. It's hot. When I was there, it was 142 degrees above zero. That's hot. And so, um, you know, uh, that's the one guy. Jesus is making Peter the rock on which you'll build the church. And so that's why he's called Kepha. Now, with Saul to Paul, that's, again, Jesus didn't make that change. Paul did. Why did he do that? Well, if he was going to go around the Greek-speaking world, which he did, he traveled all through Asia Minor and into Greece, and if he said, hi, my name is uh, Saulos, Saulos, that's how they'd have to give the name, because they Greeks can't just end a name like Saul, be Saulos. And if he used that name, it'd be kind of an embarrassment, because Saul is a good Hebrew name, uh, Shaul, Shaul, and it means the one who was asked for. Whereas Saulos in Greek means effeminate. So he'd be going around saying, hi, I'm girly man uh, from, you know, Tarsus. That would be a, a very odd name as far as Greeks were concerned, you know, to introduce yourself as girly man. So he changed the first letter of Saulos to Paulos. Because Paulos was already a long-term existing Greek name, and that's why he did that. Just you know, sometimes, you, um, you know, when you chant, go from one language to another, your name can have different meanings than intended. Uh, for instance, my own first name, Mitch, um, in Quechua, when I was working in Peru, in Quechua language. My name means a cat, like a pet cat. Uh, and so they were laughing at my name. So I had to come up with something else. It's one of those things that happens with language. All right, let's now take a, um, an email from Annette. It says, Father Mitch, I'm confused about 1 Samuel 16, verse 23. Whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, that is, King Saul, to whom uh, St. Paul was named, David would take the harp and play, and Saul would be relieved and feel better, for the evil spirit would leave him. This makes no sense to me. Why would God send an evil spirit to Saul? Okay, so that's the, um, the first part. And then, also, why would he choose David to succeed Saul, knowing what David would do to Uriah and his wife? David certainly doesn't seem like an upright man. Then there's Solomon, his great wisdom and understanding when he chose to turn away from God and follow the false gods of his wives. 
I really don't understand why God let these men become kings over Israel and would love to hear your thoughts. Annette. Well, a couple things going on here. The first part, I think, is the, the, the bigger uh, issue to, to start off with. Why did God send an evil spirit? The ancient Israelites had a very poorly developed understanding of the angels, whether the good angels or the bad. They didn't, they hadn't really thought through a lot of things. You'll see, for instance, in the book of Chronicles, describing the same place, that, you know, Satan came. And they understand more clearly that God doesn't send the evil spirits. He permits them. Just like in the book of Job, God permitted Satan to tempt. But Satan does the tempting. And that's what was going on. And also, what Saul would go through was some sort of a fit. He, he had a number of you know, the, these fits, and they understood this as God punishing him for disobeying God about offering some sacrifices and keeping some animals earlier in the book, uh, in chapter 15. So this was something that God is in charge of everything, but their understanding of the free will of the spirits was very vague. It took a few centuries for them to understand that, but about 500 years before they got a better grasp. So it's the first attempt to explain the role of the demons. The second issue about choosing David, David was righteous and did very righteously when he was called. But after he became king and then stopped going, he didn't go out with his army to fight against the Ammonites when the Ammonites started a war with Israel. He stayed home and he gave in to temptation on his own. So he was righteous when he was made king, and he delighted the Lord and was his darling. In fact, that's what David means, his darling. And yet he still sinned. When Solomon started, he was, you know, wise, but he became foolish over having too many wives and then following their gods and listening to them. So this is included here to be a warning. All of us are fallen. All of us can give in to sin and temptation. And we always have to be on our guard because no matter who you are, you can start off real well, but you can always fall into sin. And that's one of the things going on there. It just does with Judas. He was called to be an apostle and he sinned. All right. We're out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. May God bless you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And we'll be able to pay all of our bills, too, if you do that. God bless you all, and thank you. Mm -hmm.